Tonight's author, Marlon James, is the author of two previous novels. His first, John Crow's Devil, was a finalist for the Los Angeles Times Book Prize for first fiction and was New York Time, a New York Times editor's choice. His second book, The Fantastic, The Book of Night Women, won the 2010 Dayton Literary Peace Prize and was a finalist for the 2010 National Book Critics Circle Award and an NAACP Image Award. But tonight's book, his third novel, A Brief History of Seven Killings, is a doozy. Set in, the tur in turbulent 1976, a year of chaos, tragedy, and triumph in Jamaica's history, on the lead up to and the aftermath of the assassination attempt of one Bob Marley, codenamed The Singer. James's sprawling narrative is one you can try to sink your teeth into, but by the time you finish the first chapter, it's pulled in your whole head, shoulders, arms, chest, legs, and toes into the deep end of Kingston in 76. The city's about to explode, and you're holding your breath. Cops, spies, rude boys, gangsters, liberators, freedom fighters, politicians, lovers, parents, children, all living, dying, and dead. None of them are good. None of them are evil. They're just people, all equal and worthy of having their stories told. This book is an intimate epic with a capital I and a capital E. I hope I've just conveyed just a little bit of how much I love this book. Um, <laughs> So will you all please join me in welcoming Marlon James. I swear I didn't pay him to say any of that. <laughs> but I'm also glad that at the last, nobody believes me when I say at the last minute I chopped 10,000 words from the book. <laughs> and it's still too big. <laughs> Thanks for coming out. Thanks for, for, for having me. It's so great to be back in DC and be back in, in this store. Um, so a very, very loose, loose definition, a uh, loose, loose description of Brief History of Seven Killings. Uh, it's, it opens in 1976 and it ends in 1991. And initially it follows the men who in 1976 hatched a plot to kill Bob Marley. And I was always very fascinated with this. Timothy White wrote a, a biography of Bob Marley years ago. And in 1991, he updated it. He, and he, among the new chapters, was a postscript on what he thinks might have happened to these men who tried to kill him. Most of these men were just boys. Some of them weren't even 14 yet. And uh, it's, it, in its own way, it's developed a whole series of conspiracy theories, theories like Kennedy. And um, there is no real answer. And I wasn't trying to find the answer either. I was just so riveted by the idea of these men um, doing something that was just so forbidden. There was always an unwritten rule in Jamaica up to 1976, which is nobody touches the tough gun, which is what they, they call Bob Marley. The great thing about his house was that people who in any other venue in Jamaica would be shooting each other to death would be playing would be playing dominoes reasoning or, or whatever at his house so the idea that the one oasis in kingston could go through such a shootout was something that was just so profoundly disturbing for jamaica and it was a turning point things weren't weren't the same again after that <clears throat> so i'm going to read um a few sections most of this all of this novel is told in first person by different characters they're around less than 200 don't let that stop you from reading it not all of them talk that's only a hundred um so the first one is actually a ghost and his name is sir arthur george jennings and this being five o'clock i will restrict all curse words <laughs> listen dead people never stop talking maybe because death is not death at all just a detention after school. You know where you're coming from and you're always returning from it. You know where you're going though you never seem to get there and you're just dead, dead. It sounds final, but it's a word missing an ing. You come across men longer dead than you, walking all the time though heading nowhere and you listen to them howl and hiss because we're all spirits or we think we're all spirits, but we're just dead. The dead love lying under the living for three reasons. We're lying most of the time. Under the bed looks at the top of a coffin, but there is weight, 
human weight on top that you can slip into and make heavier. And you listen to the heart beat while you watch it pump. And hear nostrils hiss when the leg lungs press air and envy even the shortest breath. I have no memory of coffins. But the dead never stop talking and sometimes the living hear. This is what I wanted to say. When you're dead, speech is nothing but tangents and detours, and there's nothing to do but stray and wander a while. Well, that's at least what the others do. My point being that expired learn from the expired, but that's tricky. I could listen to myself, still claiming to anybody that would hear that I didn't fall. I was pushed over the balcony at Sunset Beach Hotel in Montego Bay. And I can say, just shut your trap, Artie Jennings, because every morning I wake up having to put my pumpkin-smashed head back together. And even as I talk now, I can hear how I sounded then, can you dig it, dingle duties? Meaning that afterlife is just not a happening scene. It's just not a groovy shindig, daddy -o. See those cool cats on the mat? They could never dig it. And there's nothing to do but wait for the man that killed me. But he won't die. And he gets older and older and trades out wives for younger and younger and breeding a whole brood of slow-witted boys and running the country into the ground. Listen. Living people wait and see because they fool themselves that they have time. Dead people see and wait. I once asked my Sunday school teacher, if heaven is a place of eternal life and hell is the opposite of heaven, what does that make hell? A place for dirty little red boys like you, she said. She's still alive. I see her at the even tired old folks home, getting too old and too stupid, not knowing her name and talking in so soft a rasp that nobody can hear that she's scared of nightfall because that's when the rats come for her good toes. I see more than that. Look hard enough and maybe just to the left and you see a country that's the same as I left it. It never changes. Whenever I'm around people, they are exactly as I left them, age making no difference. This is a story of seven killings, of boys who meant nothing to a world still spinning, but each of them, as they passed by me, carried a sweet stink scent of the man that killed me. So I'm going to move on. I swear he gets upbeat. Not really. <laughs> so one of the characters, it, it being... Uh, a story about okay there are more than seven killings in the book few people make it very all the way to the end but one of the characters that make it to the end of um, to the end is Josie Wales and Josie Wales is starts out being the second in command of a, of a big ghetto garrison in Kingston and not long in the book, he becomes first in command. And a couple of the seven killings had to happen for that for him to get there. And uh, because he's such a uh, immense figure, he he at one point is a center of political violence and becomes a center of the crack crack cocaine trade in the early nineties. Lots of people are interested in Josie Wales. So this is in this is nineteen seventy nine when Josie Wales meets the new CIA attache who take, takes over from the one before because Josie Wales is the type of guy who everybody including the CIA wants to know. Uh, should I be reading that in DC? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so this is Josie Wales. But that was 1978 and I'd done with 1978. When the old American leave for Argentina in January, a new one come and take the spot. New American song, same old lyrics. He called himself Mr. Clark. Just that, Mr. Clark. Clark, just ditch the E. He think it was funny, so he said every time we meet. Clark, just ditch the E. He already know Dr. Love, but then it seemed every American who walk around in Kingston in a sweaty white shirt with a tie open know Louis Hernan Rodrigo de las Casas. April 1978, and we're at Morgan's Harbor, the hotel for white people over in Port Royal. We're looking over at Kingston for the almost, from the almost empty restaurant when, well, they were looking. I was watching. Me with two foreigners who already feeling the pirate spirit take over them. It's a thing to watch, the kind of feeling that take up foreigners every time you take them to Port Royal. You wonder if it's the same spirit that leap up in them as soon as they land on any rock. I'm betting it is so. So, from as far back as Columbus and slavery, 
Something about landing from sea that make men feel free to say and do as they please. Did Blackbeard ever pillage and plunder these parts, matey? <laughs> Me only know about Henry Morgan, sir. Also in Jamaica, matey's a woman that a man keep that is not him wife. <laughs> oh, oops. It was a long time that I chat bad on purpose. So much so that Dr. Love have to translate two times. At least this one wasn't like Louis Johnson, holding that memo upside down and pretending to show people that nigger can't read. Something I still remember. But then he say, you poor precious people don't even know you're on the very verge of anarchy. Me not understand. If we're precious, how we must be poor. Diamond precious. But that's what you are, my boy, a diamond in the rough, so rough this island, so roughly cut and beautiful and precarious. By precarious, I mean you are teetering on, by that I mean precarious. Yes, exactamente, exactamente, isn't that right, Louis? Louis and I, we go back a ways, too far back it seems. A few Estados Latinos before this one, eh? So you're a part of that Bay of Pigs flop show? What? Huh? No, no, that was before my time. Way before my time. Well, maybe one day you people, well, well, maybe one day you people going find a poison that really work on Castro. Heh, <laughs> you're a perceptive one. Cunning even, eh? Has Louis been feeding you the news? No, the news has been feeding me the news. <laughs> Hold on now, Josie Wales. Nothing throw these Americans off more than when they realize that they were wrong about you. Remember to say at least one no problem, man, and vibrate the man like this, no problem, man, before he drive away, just so he leave thinking he find the right man. For the first time, I wish I had dreadlocks, or I know how to break into jogging on the spot, landing on one foot like a rasta do, even when there's no rhythm to dance, though. Because I spend the whole time watching Dr. Love nodding at everything this man say. I almost forget that for the most time, he was trying to tell me that Jamaica is at war. A bigger war than 1976, he say. The first time, he said 1976. The Cold War, he say. Do you know what we mean by Cold War? War do have no temperature. What? Oh no, son. Cold War is a term, a figure of, it's just a name for what's happening here. You know what? I've got something right here. Here, look at this. And the man took out a coloring book. When you keep playing fool with Americans, you learn to expect anything. But this one throw even me off. <laughs> uh, what is? I had it upside down because who need to flip around a cover to read the Democracy is for US title? The American look at me holding the book wrong and I know exactly what he was thinking. It's a breakdown, that's what it is. Louis, does he know what? I mean, look, may I have it for a second? Thanks. Let's see, let's see, let's see. Ah, pages six and seven. See on page six, this is a world in a democracy. See, people in the park, children running down the ice cream truck. Maybe somebody's over there grabbing a Twinkie. Look, see that guy reading a newspaper? And watch that chick, hot, right? Wearing that mini skirt, who knows what those kids are learning. But they go to school, and every adult in this pick, they can vote. They decide who should leave, I mean lead, the country. Oh yeah, look at the tall buildings. That's the cause of progress, markets, freedom. That's the free market, son. And if anybody in this picture doesn't like what's going on, they can say so. You want me to color the picture, boss? <laughs> what? No, no. I, I'll tell you what. Say I give you a couple dozen for that school you've got. We've got the word. We have to get the word out to the young before these pink old commies recruit them. F Damn freaks, these commies. You know why so many of them are homos? Because normal people like you and me, we reproduce. Commies, they're just like homos. They recruit. Or like any American church that come here, I think to, but don't say. <laughs> Instead, I say, true thing that boss, true thing. Good, good. You're a good man, Mr. Wales. I feel I can share things with you. I'll tell you what. This is what we're about, this what you're about to hear is classified intel. Even Kissinger hasn't been briefed yet. Even Lewis is about to hear this for the first time. Hey Lewis, bet you couldn't get what is the biggest industry in East Berlin right now. 
late term abortions. Yup, you heard me right. Late term abortions. Things are so bad that a woman would rather kill her kid rather than let it be born in East Germany. People in East Germany, they line up for everything, just like in the book. Line up for soap. You know what they do with soap? Sell it for food. Poor little bastards. Can't even score a decent cup of coffee. So the government mixes it with chicory and rye and beet and calls the whole thing mishkafe. Sounds like mischief, eh? I thought I heard everything. Boggles the mind, I tell you. Boggles the mind. You drink coffee, Mr. Wales? Me's a tea drinker, sir. I'm going to move ahead. <laughs> so, I'm going to read one. Where is it? I need to find it. So, there's two more scenes. So one of my characters, Dorcas Palmer. Dorcas Palmer is a caregiver in New York in 1985. Um, things you should know about the scene. For some reason, which she, she can't seem to figure out why, there is a handsome older white man in her apartment. And also, her name is not Dorcas Palmer. So, Dorcas. Now it's getting too dark to use it's getting dark as an excuse for him to leave. Another darker, darker Palmer, a smart one, would, have, would be wondering how the hell the evening ended with a man in her apartment. Then again, who gives a ass? A man can show up in a woman's apartment without wondering what the neighbors think. And besides, I don't know my neighbors. But if he thinks this night is going to end up like some French comedy with mean bed and him with a contented smile as he smokes a cigarette, he just made one sad mistake. He's watching the skyline from my window. Here I thought I had a stupid view. I know this part. I've watched Dynasty. I should ask him if he would like a drink. Except all I have is some cheap vodka because liquor never stopped being bitter and some pineapple juice that I can't say for sure isn't spoiled. And isn't offering a drink just a code for would you like me now? Which isn't going to happen, though he really does look like Lyle Wagoner. And I heard Lyle pose for Playgirl. The sad thing is, I really do want to slip into something more comfortable. All this tweet on a summer day was itching the rass out of me. And my feet have a, stri and my feet have a strict five-hour heels limit before they start to scream, What the hell, you're trying to kill me? I chuckle too loud, and he turns around and looks at me. A smile from a man is a down payment, Darkest Palmer. Don't sell him anything. I know I promised not to say anything about going home, I say. So don't. You have any idea how many people I know that can't keep a promise? Hmm, sound like rich people problems. Sorry, you heard me. I swear the par part of the reason why I can't leave, can't, can't, is that you seem to get bolder by the hour. Who knows what you'll be by 10? I'm not really sure if that's a compliment. Me neither, actually. We'll just have to wait until 10 then. I wanted to say something about the nerve of this man to move into my space, encroach on my time, and assume that I have nothing better to do. But then he says, But then again, you must have something better to do than humor an old man. I said you're not old two times already. Maybe you should fish for a new compliment. He laughs. Sun's gone. Got anything to drink here? Vodka, some pineapple juice, and I don't know. Got ice? I'm sure I can work up some. So you have nothing to drink then? I'll have a vodka and some pineapple juice and whatever is in the fridge. Why, your hand sick? Vodka and clean glasses over are both on the counter. He nods at me and laughs. I love this, he says. I'm starting to wonder if this is the movie where the sassy black maid gives the old patrician a reason to live again. <laughs> Yet still, there is no proof that this man is in any way old or need anybody's help for that matter. Your son and daughter must be worried by now. Maybe. There's club soda in the fridge. Can I use that? Yes. And it might be time to throw out that slice of pizza and that half box of ramen. Thank you. Any other suggestions for my fridge? I'd get rid of that half-eaten burger, too. And no self-respecting person should ever be caught drinking Coors. I wasn't actually asking suggestion for my fridge. Then why ask? You want a vodka soda with a hint of pineapple? Yes. Coming up, I watched the man take over my kitchen. 
Can't remember when I bought lime, and it must have been recently because he's using it. He tried three times to cut with a knife before he pulls another one out and strikes him against each other like he's sword fighting himself. Chop, crush, squeeze, stir. Yes, it is something to watch a man work. I don't know if I've ever seen a man in a kitchen who wasn't on TV. He walks over with both bottles and hands one to me. Well, is it any good? It's very good. Well, thanks for the enthusiasm. It's wonderful, really. He sits down in the armchair that I had my neighbor help carry up. He's sipping slow, sipping slow, as if he, if he doesn't want the drink to end. And by extension, this stay. Aren't you itching in that skirt? I mean, it's summer. I'm not taking off my skirt. I don't think I asked you to. You're wondering how much of a mistake you made inviting me over. No. So yes, then. I don't double talk. Good. It's weird to think of it, but the only way I can describe how he sits is strong. I notice it at his home and on the subway as well. Him rejecting all these cheers, inviting him to slump and sitting straight with his back, back arched. Must be from his days in the, in the military. Don't you have any music? You want to hear what the happening kids are listening to these days? Yes, actually. What's the latest? That good times is quite good, isn't it? Quite good. Boy, you've been out of it. I get up and put on a record. Well, the one on top of the stack. Funny, back in Jamaica, records were what my father listened to, and it was always dreary instrumental stuff like Billy Vaughan La Paloma and stuff from the James Last Orchestra. 1985, and I must be the only person to have one of those all-in-one stereo cabinets, at least one named Telefunken. Church organs? Good gracious, are you playing church music? No, that's a preacher, and he's definitely talking about the afterworld, and that's, those are organs. Shut up and listen. He sits back, just as Prince says, in this life, you're on your own. <laughs> oh my, oh my, I do quite like this. He stands back, snapping his fingers, nodding his head. I wonder if he was a teenager during Elvis and what he thought of the Beatles. I want to ask him if he likes rock and roll, but the question seems silly for a man finger snapping and tapping like Bill Cosby just taught him jive. Let's go crazy. Let's get nuts, he says. I feel guilty for not dancing, so I get up and dance. And then I do something I never, ever, ever do. Doctor, everything will be all right. Makes everything go wrong. I grab the comb on the kitchen counter, and it's a microphone for three woo-hoo-hoos. And then the guitar solo comes, and at first I think he's having a heart attack, but he's actually miming the guitar solo with his hands. I'm jumping and yell, go crazy, go crazy, and the song stretches out so long. I mean, I've listened to that song 10 million times, but it's never been this long, until it just collapses, and so do we. I'm on the floor, he's on the couch. He jumps right back up when Take Me With You comes on, but I'm still on the floor panting and laughing. That may be the most fun I've had since the Beatles came on Ed Sullivan. Is what with you people and the Beatles? They're only the greatest rock band of all time. The last client had us standing outside John Lennon's hotel all night, all night that night. Whatever for? Was he recording with Paul? What? I'm not sure that's funny. He walks over to the stereo and picks up the album jacket. Who's the homely looking dyke on the bike? That's Prince. Prince who? Just Prince. The mustache wasn't a giveaway. Well, my second thought was that this was the hottest bearded lady ever. He has a movie showing called Purple Rain. Purple Haze, Rain, Prince, not Jimmy. I should probably take that off. He gets a little explicit. Sweetie, I'm the only white man in five boroughs who actually owns Blowfly Records. This Prince doesn't scare me. Sorry for calling you, sweetie. I understand women aren't into being spoken to that way anymore. I wanted to tell him I didn't mind, and that it's still the first time anybody, certainly any man, has called me anything nice in a while. But I looked out the window at the skylight instead. Who's the girl on the cover? Apollonia. She's supposed to be his girlfriend in real life. Ah, oh, so he's not gay then? You must be hungry. You didn't eat any of the pizza at your house. I'm, I am kinda. What you got? Nachos and ramen. Good lord, not together. You prefer we call chicken McNuggets? 
my lady does have a point. I put the kettle on for the noodles, which means time just sitting by and listening to the rest of the album. But I know I won't be able to sit through the silence, and neither will he. So where are you from, exactly? So a final thing, anyway, because I want to get to questions as quickly as possible. This one would be pretty short, if I find it. So, um, while I look for it. Just had it and it went. So the final section I'm reading from is um, the ghost as well, and um, you notice that Bob Marley isn't really mentioned, and in the book he's called a singer, and um, he doesn't re never really becomes a character, but Arthur Jennings has a way of speaking, if, if Arthur Jennings, in the character in the book, if Arthur is speaking to you, it means you're either dead or you're about to die. So here he's speaking to the singer. I us read a few sections and we jump to it. Um, you're in New York. It's September 21. Everybody knows you're always the first to wake up and the last to go to sleep, especially in a studio. Nobody notices that you haven't done either in a year. You wake up burning. The mattress has sucked two pounds of water from your skin, but you can hear the air conditioner humming somewhere near you. You think of the pain on the right side of your head, and it's there. Now you wonder if the pain was just a thought until you thought about it. Or maybe you did speak a curse into being that the old woman in the hills would say. You do know it's September 21. You have no memory of the second show the night before. You have no idea where you are or who is here with you, but at least you know this is New York. You're jogging in Central Park South. Different country, same crew. And for, the sec for a second, you feel as if you're back in Bull Bay before sunrise. But you're still in New York, and humidity is already sweeping in. You lift your le left leg high, widening your stride before it hits the dirt, the dirt, but your right leg refuses to move. Your hips swing, but your right leg just won't move. Think, lift it without thinking, that doesn't work. Lift it with thinking, that doesn't work either. And now your left won't move. Both legs stall, even after you've commanded them. To, commanded them. Your friend is coming up behind you and you call out, but your neck twists about half inch and locks. No nodding yes, no nodding no. A scream vanishes on the way from your throat to your lips. Your body's leaning and you can't stop it. No, it, no, no, it's not leaning but toppling. And you cannot stretch your arms to break the fall. The ground lands into your face, slams into you face first. You wake up in the Essex house. Hands and feet recover but the fear lingers. Too weak to leave the bed, you don't know that they lied to your wife only minutes before and turn her away. You wake up and smell sex, smoke, and whiskey. You see and wait, but nobody listens, nobody looks, nobody comes. Your ears wake up to friends running charges up in the room. Friends with friends, friends with groupies, friends with Rastaman on a free base with a chillum pipe. Men in suits, men on the make, businessmen drinking your wine, your room a temple waiting for Jesus to scour. Brooklyn boys pass by and guns, Rastafari all doused out. You have no strength to stand, no lips to curse, so you whisper, please close the door. You collapse in Pittsburgh. It's never a good thing when hearing, hearing doctors talk using a word that ends with Oma. The Oma has hop, skipped and jumped from your foot to your liver, lungs and brain. In Manhattan, they blast you with radium and your locks drop and scatter. You go to Miami, then Mexico, to the clinic that couldn't save Steve McQueen. Somebody's driving you through Bavaria, near the Austrian border. A hospital sprouting out of the forest like magic. Hills in the background tipped with snow like cake icing. You meet the tall and frosty Bavarian, the man who helps the hopeless. He smiles, but his eyes are set too far back, and they vanish in the shadow of his brow. 
Cancer is a red alert that the whole body is in danger, he says. Thank God the food he forbids, Rastafari had forbidden a long time. A sunrise is a promise. But the Bavarian bows out. Nobody speaks of hope. Nobody speaks of anything. You're in Miami with no memory of the flight. May 11, eyes open. You're the first one up, just like old times. But all you see are old woman's hands overrun with black veins and bony, jutting kneecaps. A plastic machine with veins pushed into your skin, doing all the living for you. You already feel like sleep, probably from all the drugs, but this one comes on like a creeper, and you already know that wherever you go this time, there is no coming back. Something coming out from the window, sounding like that Stevie Wonder tune, Master Blaster. In New York City and in Kingston, both skies blaze bright with noon white. Thunder breaks out and a lightning bolt slashes through the clouds. Summer lightning, three months too early. The woman waking up in Manhattan and the woman sitting on the porch in Kingston both know. You're gone. Thank you. So I think this is the, the question and answer section. And there's a mic there. Hmm? So uh, a writer I admire uh, once said, you know, when he was about the writing process, he said not to worry because it kind of <laughs> almost always comes out of the pen wrong. Mm -hmm. So many of the characters in this book have so many such a precise or imprecise way of speaking. Mm -hmm. Is it one of those things where it almost feels like you're kind of channeling those voices or is this the kind of thing where you got to you know, in terms of their perspective and their point of view, you're rewriting it and rewriting it and rewriting it. I think it's both. Um, sometimes it, I think the, 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 the writing and the rewriting and all this struggle at the beginning does lead to that point where they just start to write themselves. Because the first person you have to shut up when you're writing is yourself. Um, it's it's, it's a, especially a novel with like this as told in pretty much all these first person voices, the person that had to shut up was me. Yeah. And um because you you know you you, you kinda wanna get into the excitement as well and you you wanna um jump in and tell your characters how to think. And I'm very big on that and I always get shut down by my own characters all the time. And um so there part of it is that just figuring it out. I mean I think fiction writing is also a kind of detective work. And uh, and you you sort of you have to get to know your characters and what they want and what they don't want, and I think after a while, if you're lucky, they kind of start writing the book. They kind of write you, and then you just sort of become this medium in a way, and that that was a lot of fun. And that was um, but it still took around two years to get to that point. Sure. That um the the. the separating characters, making sure they don't sound like each other, make sure they don't sound like you. And uh, and this one was hard because, uh, you know, in 1976, I was six years old. So <laughs> it's not like, I, you know, my sharp ear of a critic was listening to Tona and Fitch all that time. Uh, so so a lot of it was doing the, doing a lot of research and, 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 and especially how people talked. But ultimately, it's still the things that make the things that make language work is the same thing that make plot makes plot work, or point of view. Do you have characters, and are they three dimensional? Do they have the, the the capability for change, even if they never do, or change for the worse? And how? And uh, I, I I I like characters who who, even if you like, you're gonna pay for it. Uh, characters that you feel. My favorite characters are characters I'm deeply conflicted about because I could like people and it's like meeting the pleasant person at the party. I will forget their name as soon as I leave. Uh, but the characters that you're deeply conflicted about, like Josie Wales, you know, is a murderous psychopath who does some interesting things to our crack house, but he has such a sparkling worldview. Uh, it's, it's something funny enough. This is something I learned from Jane Austen, which was the last name I bet you expect to hear today. 
But Jane Austen has a way, especially in a novel like Pride and Prejudice, where her most unsavory characters have the, the realest worldview. So Elizabeth's best friend who marries Mr. Collins, who nobody wants, but Elizabeth's best friend knows what time it is. If she don't get married, she's going to end up in a poorhouse destitute somewhere. She knows what time it is. And that's one thing uh, uh, about the book, that some of the characters, despite their grievous flaws, sometimes those are the ones that know what time it is. Yeah. <laughs> Marlon, good yeah. to see you. It's been a while since Calabash yeah. when you were running off with Zadie Smith for some <laughs> confab, right? <laughs> I'm just curious, I heard somewhere that uh, you use storyboards for, with so many characters going mm -hmm. on in your book that it is something very visual that you actually sometimes put the characters maybe on a wall or yeah. something like that. And it seems to me that when, when you see that visual, that are you incorporating um, new stories and snippets of things within that storyboard so mm -hmm. that there is uh, some sort of a flow that's going on? And, and does that sometimes get kind of mixed up, you know, with stoppages and, and continuities that, uh, yeah. that affect the way that the book comes out? It, it does. The, I, I actually have this chart on my wall. Um, it was It's a spreadsheet with characters, all the characters in different rows, well, different columns and rows. And I even, because even though the book is pretty long, each section is a day. So I, I needed to know what was going on at 3.45 in the afternoon and so on because, you know, it's a big cast. I want to keep track of them. The funny thing about that type of structure, which to a lot of people seems like the death of art, is that that is what actually allowed me to be crazy with it. Because even though I have it written down, it doesn't mean I followed it. And it also means that one thing that would, would have easily happened is playing favorites. Because I, you know, I, yeah, I, I do like some characters more than others. Uh, you know, um, nursing assistant is not going to meet sexually conflicted gay hitman on his first run in New York. <laughs> Come on. Which movie are you going to watch? <laughs> so it, it kind of forced me to, 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 to keep characters on an even keel. But it also just like gave me the, 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 the leeway to be really crazy with it. I had one rule with with writing this, and it's also a rule I had with um with my last book. And part of it too is, you know, my literary coming of age is reading the Victorian novels, and uh, part of, and it was simply, is there anything that happened today where I go, I didn't see that coming? Because I think you have that's the thing about char when when you have char when characters become real people, they do what real people do. Real people disappoint. Real people surprise is, is one thing I think that separates us from every other animal or capacity to surprise ourselves. So that was my one rule. If it didn't happen, that was a failed day for me. But the, the putting things up just had me keep things in perspective and had me not forget anybody. And the fact that your folks were cops and your dad was a judge mm -hmm. and all that, is it wondering about some of what they were doing in their lives as far as your autobiography that would affect kind of the policier kind of aspects? Um, not really. Um, because, you know, I mean, I get in the 70s, I was a kid. So, the, you know, I, the fact is, you know, a real-life detective is just not as fascinating as Starsky and Hutch. <laughs> And, uh, and, and, and one thing with having a, a mother who's a cop and, and, and being involved in the police force is that you do see the, the, the absolutely dull stuff. Mm. But at the same time, it's only in hindsight, you know, I realized just how safe she kept that house. Because we had a pretty stable to the point of boring upbringing in a not very stable time, mm. in a not very stable country. So, you know, some of all... I mean, her greatest work of detection is to, come, is to do things unnoticed. I'm just now here, you know, even now we have this, this running gag because I always was convinced that she, had, she didn't have a gun in the house. There's no such thing as a Jamaican cop <laughs> with no gun in the house. It's for the goats. Yeah, I never found it. And I found everything else. <laughs> Marlon, what's hey, up? Hey, I haven't seen you in like a year. Yeah, it's been a while. Congrats on the book. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask, you've spoken a bit about inspiration, about the Victorian novels, about mm -hmm. Austen. 
I read somewhere that in writing about Marley, you were somewhat inspired by reading uh, Gay Talese writing about uh, Frank Sinatra. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if you actively search for inspiration when you're kind of outside the realm of creating your art or if stuff just kind of happens and then you think, oh, this could help me in my book in some way. Uh, both. I do actually look, look at um, pretty much every book or novel I've written, including this, I, can, I create a reading library. Stuff that I think, um, stuff that I have an instinct will be relevant. A lot of them you reach fifth, page 15 and go, this is crap. <laughs> or this is not going to help. But yeah, like for example, but I, I do um, books that I, I think would be some sort of spiritual forebear. Um, of his book. For, um, the book I probably consulted the most with this was James Elroy's American Tabloid. And... Um, you know, I think the whole idea of the great American novel is utterly ludicrous. But if you were to torture me, <laughs> I would say American tabloid. Yeah. Uh, w for lots of reasons. One, also because it, 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 it deals with the political and the profane. But also, it's a very, very big story told on a very sort of small level. All the characters are marginal. None of these characters, are, few of these characters make history books. So that, of course, was a big influence on me but um but also when you're when you when you 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 start to tell yourself that you want to take risks and you want to start of go off the map um sometimes reading people who have done it can be kind of it can be nothing more than just inspirational even if you don't follow them follow them to the t like a huge one especially in the middle of this book was mrs dalloway uh, uh, and so what does that mean? Does that mean you go back and read that in the midst of writing it? Yeah, or, okay. I'm reading even in the midst of, of writing. Yeah. Um, at the time, and, and you can tell, usually if I give you the list of books I was reading, you can tell what I was reading where. Sure, sure. <laughs> um, and, 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 and there I was reading a lot of Mrs. Dalloway, uh, Margaret Dura's The North China Lover. Mm -hmm. Not The Lover. The North China Lover is better. Take it from me. <laughs> um, but just the 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 because uh, you know just this thought of um, be confident in breaking with form yeah. and playing with stream of consciousness and so on. So yeah, but also some of the books were not my idea. Um, my friend Rachel um, Pearlmeter, who is actually no longer with us. Um, she was the one who, who, when I was writing this and I'd come to her with every mini crisis, I'm like, I don't have a novel because at the time I thought it was just one person's story and that would carry the whole thing. And, and she was the first to say, you know, why do you think it's one person's story? Yeah. When last have you read As I Lay Dying? Mm. So of course I went back and read it, um, As I Lay Dying and, and it was the big Eureka moment. I see. Uh, so, so yeah, I also, because I just can't shut up when I'm writing, I tell everybody, I'm writing this and I'm having this problem. Fix it. <laughs> and I have friends who can fix it. So, <laughs> so yeah, and you, you open it. So, I realized at the end of this book, I had read probably around 40 books. Wow. And that's just a fiction. Yeah. Uh, the stuff for, for actual research and the text and the source materials and then newspaper clippings and so on. That's a whole different kind of thing. But yeah, I, I, I kind of anticipate where I'm going and I, I read those books. And, um, and also, you know, when I talk to people, I really listen mm. to what they say and, and so on. And because, you know, they, as I said, some of the best ideas for this book weren't mine. Mm. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Congrats Thanks. again. Yeah. Well, I, you know, that brought to mind the question, you know, you have, um, you know, so many writers who come and say they can't read anybody else mm -hmm. when they're writing, when they're writing a novel, or, you know, or, or, you know, they're writing their book. And so, you know, in your process, mm -hmm. w you know, why is that necessary for you, say, uh, as opposed to maybe somebody else who says, you know, I can't, you know, I put aside all reading and... Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, I think I think um, sometimes people put aside all reading because they really want to protect the integrity of their voice, mm -hmm. and I totally understand that. I don't follow it. <laughs> I, I, I I totally understand that. Um, I do not write like that. I do think books are in conversation with books, 
uh, the, my favorite, I think the fa- my favorite statement from um, favorite saying from Cormac McCarthy. He says, "Books come out of books." So now that I'm trying to to shamelessly emulate Mrs. Dalloway because she'd be quite surprised that she was an influence at all. <laughs> <laughs> Probably Elroy would be shocked too. Yeah. You know, I don't end up so. I hope I end up sounding nothing like them. But I also just, I, I just, I don't know if I believe in this sort of locked in a room with the purity of your art because I don't think novel is a pure form. I think um, the best novels are in, 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 in conversation, even sometimes in competition with, with, with other books. Um, and also, but part of it also is a personal thing. Books end up a lot in my books. And this one is slightly different. A lot of music ends up in, the, in it, in, in, in this one. Um, not just reggae. Um, you know, a big turning point for one of the characters is hearing the Velvet Underground. So, um, but I, I, I like the sort of noise and the conversation. I read straight through when I'm, I'm writing, sometimes to the detriment of the writing because I'm too busy reading. <laughs> I also absolutely love to not write. <laughs> so any excuse I can use <laughs> to not write, I'll take it. And reading is the worst of the lot. <laughs> But yeah, I think I that's how I write. I like having all these noises and all these writers um, in my head. And I, um, you know, reading Mrs. Dalloway in the night and writing in the morning was just the greatest thing. Mm. Yeah. yeah. I had another question. Yes. Um, uh, how'd you come up with the story? Well, what's the sort of origin of it? Oh my God! This again, as I said before, I mean, the real origin of the story was was that Timothy White article that I read, and it's funny because the article came out what a good fifteen years before my first novel. So in a lot of ways, this has been haunting me from before I even went back to to actually writing seriously. And this novel is, is sort of the trickiest beginning of the lot because there are lots of stops and starts. Um, as I was telling you in the back room, if the actual page one of this novel is now page 446. <laughs> and that's the character I came up with first. The, the, the um, you know, my, 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 my hitman from Chicago. Um, I think it's, it's, I don't know. I think with this, I was just so interested in these disparate strands. And each and the original idea was, or the, what happened at one point was, I did think it was a series of small novels that I kept failing at. And as I say, it wasn't until my friend um, Rachel who saw the links between them, and I then went back and 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 read them. Um, there, you know, the 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 things that triggered it's one of the things that I actually really, in terms of getting to the format of this. Some of the, the 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 final influences are so disparate. One was a, a biography of Joseph Papp, um, uh, who de- who developed the public theater in New York. The oral biography where all these voices are together, saying creating one story. And another one was um, um, Bolaño's The Savage Detectives. You know, I really like the idea of throwing a story to the people instead of me as big authorial voice. Um, trying to trying to muscle my way in it. So it was that the 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 that's how it sort of came out of just taking all these voices and me wanting to write this sort of imagined oral biography. It kind of didn't happen that turn out that way, and it kind of did. Some of these people won't shut up, but um, that's how it began. Yeah, yeah. What was the hardest part of writing this novel, and how did you deal with it? How did you move through it? The hardest part of writing this novel. Um, God, it was all hard. <laughs> I don't know. I think that the the maybe the hardest part is I'm trying to think if if because it wasn't really that hard. I think the the hardest part may have been man. It's funny because I either think it was all hard or or it just you know. Funny enough, for me, the hardest part of of, of writing is always coming up with the idea. It's um, recognizing that there's a story there. And this one, I panicked quite a bit because all these stories kept ending before me. Before I was realizing that they kept ending because they're part of a bigger story. So I, you know, I, I'm a pretty fast writer. Once I get an idea, I can pretty much breeze through it, but it will take me two years to come up with an idea. 
So figuring out what to write to me is the absolute pits. It's the worst thing um, in the world. The hardest thing for the for for other than that, I think the hardest thing was to remember to give people uh, um, ex give people an internal and external lives and and remember that nobody's ever one thing. Mm -hmm. So because I like even, as much as I like complicated characters, it's so easy to not do it. Sometimes you just want somebody to hate somebody. You know, I like I like Bill Sykes. Bill Sykes, you know, I like Anton Chigurh in, in No Country for Old Men. They're just uncomplicated evil. And yeah, but uh, if you get to spend a lot of time with that character, then it, it just starts to seem more flawed than anything else. So a lot of that was going back and remembering that. Mm -hmm. Um, and going back and, and saying, you know, you have to be as fair to the bad guys as you are to the good ones. So um, that was, it was more challenging than anything else. But honestly, my, the hardest part for me with novels is just coming up with them. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. We have time for some more. Yeah, we have time for maybe one more question. Mm-hmm. Yep. I was just thinking, um, if fiction is a way of telling the truth, mm -hmm. so to speak, what did the process of creating this novel uh, teach you about the events in Jamaica? The events in Jamaica? Yeah, or Jamaica at that particular time. Um, what did it teach me? It's certainly that there is no one story, and that's really frustrating. And that th there can never be no narrative. I mean, this novel doesn't try to solve anything either. One of the things I realized, it's a lot of things to that, that a lot of times the written history of our country is not the history at all. It's not the story at all. In, in, I was, even growing up in Jamaica, I trusted rumors a lot more than I trusted facts. <laughs> uh, I, uh, and I still do. I, I, I don't want to hear what the newspaper report is. I want to know what, you know, Miss Liza around the street said. Um, because it's usually, which is not to say it's more authentic necessarily, uh, or well, not true, but definitely more authentic. Um, you realize that it's it's um, if one thing writing this fiction taught me, I realize is what a great need for a nonfiction there is. Um, what a great need for new histories, and so on. Because I, I you know, as a as a fiction writer, I like to talk about the internal lives of 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 characters and people who are marginal or marginalized and finding depth and feeling to them. But it also, going through it, I realized just how much of it we still don't know, how much of it we still have one version, which may not be the true version, and one version of anything is not great anyway. Um, and it, yeah, it, 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 just realizing just how many gaps there are in the story and how many versions there is, and, and just how much of that past we still don't know. And and how much of how much of that past we're still repeating. One of the characters in the book said the thing that frustrates her most about Jamaica is that um, every time she goes back, it's exactly as she left it. And that's both true. It's both true and not true. But it's it's true in the ways that it shouldn't be. That we we, we feel as if we're still on the same cycle, and that it keeps perpetuating itself and going round and round. Even though we develop more awareness, more resources, more intelligence, and so on, that we're still kind of repeating the you know the same habits um and i i think in 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 the absence of facts and of truths that whole thing about fiction being the lie that tells the truth i think becomes just more and more important because um they may because right now it's the only stories we got yeah all right i think that's it thank you